to the New York Genome Center. I'm Kathleen Kearns, the Vice President for External Affairs here at the Center. Uh, we're delighted to host DNA Day here, DNA Day as designated by the National Institutes of Health for uh, two reasons. In April, on April 25th in 1953 is when Watson and Crick and their colleagues published papers on the structure of DNA and the double helix. And then on April 25th, 2003, marked the completion of the Human Genome Project. And one of our colleagues who's on the panel tonight worked on that project, Mike Zodi, is going to tell you a little bit more about that. We have a, a chock full schedule, so um, I'm just here to welcome you. Thank you very much for coming and joining us this evening. Uh, we'll have each of the speakers make their presentations, and then we're going to have panel discussion. If you can, we ask you to please wait and hold your questions till then. We'll try to get to as many of you as we can. After we wrap it up, we have a collation, a nice uh, cocktail reception in the room around the corner. Thanks again very much for coming, and I'm delighted to introduce you to my colleague, Peter Smybert, who is the manager of our Tech Innovation Lab. Thanks again. So, as Kathy mentioned, my name's Peter Smybert. I'm the manager of the Technology Innovation Lab here at the New York Genome Center. I'm going to give you a brief introduction into DNA today, how it functions within our cells, and then show some examples of some work that we're doing in the innovation lab in the, in the field of uh, single cell genomics. Uh, Kathy mentioned today is DNA Day. I found out just today that it's actually also World Penguin Day. So if you're here for any talks on penguins, I'm sorry, this is, this is the wrong place. Um, so after I give my presentation, Mike, Tanya, and Neville will speak about the importance of reading and, mani and manipulating the genome. Uh, in, especially in, in the context of disease research and in healthcare. So I'd like to begin by starting with the basic structure of DNA. It's comprised of four bases, A, C, G, and T, which I'm sure everyone in the room probably knows. Uh, a always pairs with T, G always pairs with C. The two strands are drawn, he drawn here as neat, straight lines, but in reality, they arrange in this anti-parallel double helix. And this is actually a figure drawn by, I didn't realize this at the time, but uh, um, Francis Crick's wife and an unaccredited author of, of, of this paper, this seminal paper in 1953, is demonstrating the double helical nature of DNA and, and showing the anti-parallel nature as well. So one strand is going in this direction, one strand is going in this direction. So when DNA needs to be replicated, the two strands are separated and an enzyme makes a complementary copy of each of the strands. This happens almost every time a cell divides uh, and it's how the full complement of your DNA ends up in ev almost every cell in your body. There are a few exceptions, but let's say every cell. So I'm sure many of you will have heard of DNA being referred to as the blueprint of life. You can think of it as a store where all the instructions uh, that are required to build an organism reside. But rather than just a single floor plan, it's really useful to actually think of an organism as a bustling city. So. Just for a bit of reference, this is the New York Genome Center. This is where we're sitting right now. A view from the World, One World Trade Center taken by one of the people in, uh, in my lab. Uh, so cities have many types of buildings. There's houses, apartments, shops, offices, industry, as well as infrastructure that enables the city to function. Things like transportation routes, roads, subways, sewers, power grids, communication systems, water supplies. And our, our, our bodies have a vast array of cell types that perform somewhat analogous roles to some of these components of a city. But as I mentioned, almost every cell in your body encodes the complete instructions for the entire organism. So from this homogeneity at the level of DNA, how, how does this vast complexity of cells emerge? Well, how you generate complexity from a, a large set of instructions is actually quite conceptually easy. You have a very, very large set of instructions. You just choose which ones you read in any one particular cell. And that's how you can generate a very large number of different outcomes. So a quick look at the mechanics of how DNA stores and transmits information makes this clear. As I mentioned earlier, the first job of DNA is to replicate itself in a, in a very faithful manner. It does this by copying itself every time a cell divides to produce two daughter cells. Occasionally, mistakes are made. And if these mistakes are not repaired, uh, they can be propagated through subsequent cell divisions and become mutations that can be the cause of genetic diseases. So Mike and Tanya will speak about detecting these mutations and Neville will speak about how to artificially induce them in order to study diseases. So within the cell, interpreting the genome 
is done by converting selected regions of DNA, which are known as genes, into a related molecule named RNA, specifically messenger RNA. Now, most genes that are well known and studied, the RNA acts as an intermediate, intermediary that is translated into a protein. And proteins do the majority of the work in a cell. Uh, they're really the workhorses. They provide structure, they make energy, they participate in communication either within the cell, between cells, and they also have you know, roles in taking out the trash, breaking up molecules, building new molecules, etc. Uh, so with today being National DNA Day, it's worth reflecting on the Human Genome Project. Kathy already introduced this, and Mike's going to speak about it a bit later. This is a massive undertaking begun over 20 years ago with the goal of sequencing the human genome and identifying all the genes that it contains. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to a really similarly ambitious project that's just started within the last couple of years, referred to as the Human Cell Atlas. The goal of this project is to create a comprehensive reference maps of all the cell types in the human body. And because, as I mentioned, the differences between cells of an individual at the DNA level, uh, or, sorry, the differences between cells are primarily, primarily the result of the RNAs and the proteins that those cells express, for the next few minutes, I'm going to overrule the NIH and refer to this as National RNA and Protein Day. So when you're studying the genome, most of the time you can take a sample of tissue, you can grind it up, and you can pull out all the DNA and sequence it. And for the majority of genome sequencing studies, the very minor differences that exist between cells of an individual make absolutely no difference for, for the majority of studies that we do. However, when we're looking at different cell types, this is not the case. A useful analogy is to think of this type of sample as looking at a fruit smoothie. A fruit smoothie, if you think of the flavor of, of a fruit smoothie, the flavor is really the average of all the components. And the flavor is dominated by the most abundant fruits contained within the smoothie or those that have the strongest flavor or a combination of the two. If you contrast this to a fruit salad, where you can really easily readily determine what the ingredients are and what proportions they're present. Um, and so if you're trying to discern cell types, it's much easier to look at a fruit salad than it is to look at a fruit smoothie. So by analogy, it's important to look at individual cells. So how do you do that? How do you look at individual cells? For the last few decades, the easiest way to do this and the most commonly, way, commonly used way to do this was to use a technique called flow cytometry. Flow cytometry uses antibodies. So these are molecules derived from the immune system that recognize specific proteins. So researchers would label these antibodies with fluorescent dyes and use them to, to label cells, stain cells, and detect which proteins the cells express by the fluorescent tags that they can detect. Uh, it's extremely fast, this method, and it can profile many thousands of cells very easily, but it's limited in the sense that it can only, uh, it can only assay a low number of markers at any one time. In the last decade, single cell RNA sequencing has become possible through a series of technological advances. And the scale to which it can be performed has increased exponentially. From the first sequencing of a single cell, what's widely regarded as the first sequencing of a single cell in 2009, now it's very common for studies to have 100,000 single cells sequenced in a, in a, in a single publication. Uh, RNA sequencing has the advantage that it's unbiased. Theoretically, it can detect any RNA molecule. However, it lacks the sensitivity of flow cytometry. So the question when you're doing single cell analysis is, at the moment, do I do RNA-seq and get <clears throat> broad but insensitive detection of the RNAs in the cell? Or do I do flow cytometry and have narrow but very highly sensitive detection of the proteins in the cell? So one of the researchers in, in our group, Marlon Stokius, asked, why don't we have both? And so he devised a way to measure proteins and RNA of single cells at the same time. And we call this method SiteSeq. SiteSeq allows us to look at single cells at unprecedented detail. For the same cell, we can now look at all the RNAs and a very large number of proteins at the same time. In this plot, I'm showing uh, cells from human blood and the uh, eight different markers that we, that we can look at by SiteSeq. And so in the top here, you can, well, you can see here the different cell types expressed in a cartoon, and this is just the RNA for particular genes and the protein for particular genes. And so this is for eight, but at the moment we're working on 82, and we're using this technique uh, widely in collaboration with a number of groups, both at the Genome Center and beyond, 
Uh, we're investigating the healthy immune system, cancer, autoimmune disease, and many other uh, topics. Um, so with that, I'll briefly thank the people in the, in the group who do all the work. This is Marlon, who I mentioned before, who had the revelation and was hoisted up by the rest of us. Um, and we collaborate with Rahul Satija's group here at the Genome Center. And so with that, I'll hand over to Mike, who's going to talk about uh, the human genome, going from the Human Genome Project to precision medicine. Thank All you. right, so I'm going to talk about bringing us back to DNA, the Human Genome Project, and what we've learned since then and some of the things that we're doing now. So this photograph is from the announcement of the initial draft sequencing of the human genome. Bill Clinton there with Francis Collins, who led the public effort to sequence the genome, and Craig Venter, who ran the private company Solera that also generated a draft genome of the human uh, genome at the same time. Now, I was working at the Whitehead Institute at the time, and I was actually there for that announcement. You can see me in this still from the uh, Nova video. My head is just over the little play button on there. And that row of four very young looking guys there is actually part of the senior leadership team for the Whitehead Center for Genome Research that generated about a third of all the sequence for the original draft of the human genome. So what did we actually build? Well, this was a single human reference genome. And it's not any one person's genome. It's a representation of a single human genome built up as a mosaic from many different people who donated their DNA for this project. And the reference allows us to have a sort of parts list for the genome. For the first time, we had all the bases in the genome, and we could identify all the genes. And so the space of genetic change that affected traits that people had and diseases that people got was now known to us. And this has enabled a lot of experimentation that was not easy to do before the entire genome was known. And even today, we've now around the world sequenced a couple hundred thousand genomes of individual people. But for every one of those experiments, we still start by taking that individual's genome and comparing it to this reference genome that resulted from the Human Genome Project to find the things that are different and to give ourselves a coordinate system to talk about changes and discuss what we're looking at in an individual's genome. So what did this giant project cost? It was a very large and ambitious project by any measure. The government allocated $3 billion for this, split between the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Energy. The project actually spent about $2.7 billion of that. So we actually came in under budget on this project. And we finished ahead of schedule as well. It was originally slated to run for 15 years and was completed in 13. The actual cost of the human reference genome is difficult to pin down, but is estimated to be about half a billion to $1 billion, including contributions from non-US groups that participated in this international project. And the remainder of the money that was allocated for this went to other parts of the project, such as technology development. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the impacts of that. Model organism sequencing. So the Human Genome Project also sequenced important model organisms, such as the bacteria E. coli, a yeast, and the mouse genome. Um, and various other things that were necessary for this, as well as a bioethics component, what we called the ethical, legal, and social implications of genome sequencing to try to understand how was it going to change society and medical treatment that we were now going to have this information that we'd never had before. When we finished the genome in 2003, we estimated at that time that if we had started at that date with the technology we had and done it over again, that it would have taken about a year and cost about $50 million. Today, the cost of a single human genome, as Tanya will discuss in more detail, is under $2,000. And this graph sort of shows the price decrease over this time period. The white uh, line there, the, the straight line, is Moore's Law. This is the, the rule that computing power for the amount of money that you pay has, has gone up by a factor of two approximately every 18 months over the last 50 years due to technological improvement. The green line is the cost of genome sequencing and how that's gone down over the last 15 years. And it's actually gone down considerably faster 
then the price of computing has gone down. And there are a few interesting points here. This little first inflection on the graph was the introduction of the first of what we call massively parallel sequencing technologies by a now uh, defunct company called 454. Right around here, we see the first production instrument from a company called Illumina, which makes most of the sequencers in use around the world today. And that was another massively parallel technology that allowed us to do even more sequencing at a time than the 454 did. And that starts this really precipitous drop. And the latest iteration of Illumina's technology with what they call pattern flow cells gave us another drop in cost there. Um, quite recently, and so we're still, we're still going down on this curve. So was all of this worth it? And I'll talk about this from two perspectives. The first one is financial, and this is some data um, from the Battelle Institute, which did a study about seven or eight years ago, and they looked from 1998 to 2010 and estimated how much private sector business was generated as a result of the data and technologies that came out of the Human Genome Project and they estimated that there was almost $800 billion in economic output as a result of the basic research that the Genome Project had paid for, including $240 billion in personal income from over 3 million man years of employment in the genomics industry, or about 140 to 1 return on the government's expenditure. And in terms of whether the government actually got its money back, they estimated that in 2010 alone, federal tax revenue from genomic business almost covered the entire 13-year cost of the Human Genome Project. Now, the other question is, what was it worth in terms of, of medicine and uh, clinical treatment? And this is a cartoon from about the time the genome was finished. You can see these guys have the jigsaw puzzle, three billion pieces. That's the approximate number of bases in the human genome. And we put it together, but now what does it, what does it mean? So I'm going to talk about how this is impacting disease, and I'm going to talk about three different kinds of non-infectious or possibly genetic diseases, Mendelian or rare diseases, complex or common diseases, and I'm actually going to leave off cancer because Neville's going to touch on cancer and genomics in his talk. Um, so Mendelian diseases are named after Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics, who in the 19th century established the basic rules of genetic inheritance. And the reason that these are known as Mendelian is like the traits that Mendel studied, these are typically caused by a single change in a single gene. And in human populations, these diseases are individually rare. Anywhere from 1 in 300 people to less than 1 in 100,000 people will have any one of these diseases but there are several thousand Mendelian diseases that affect various people, and collectively they affect about 1% of the population. This woman is Nancy Wexler. She's a collaborator of ours here at the New York Genome Center. She works on a disease called Huntington's disease. And she's been working on this for a long time, going back to before the Human Genome Project. In 1968, her father Milton founded the Hereditary Disease Foundation, to fund and drive research on Huntington's genetics. About 10 years later, Nancy started working in Venezuela, where there's a small area where Huntington's disease is especially prevalent. And she eventually enrolled 18,000 people in a study of Huntington's disease. And over the course of four years, they mapped the approximate location of the causal mutation for Huntington's, which is on human chromosome 4. It took them another 10 years from that point to actually identify the gene and the mutation which cause Huntington's disease. And I will note that we're still actively working on Huntington's because we still don't have effective treatments and cures, even though we've known what the gene is for 25 years now. But I'm going to contrast this with a more recent story, an even rarer Mendelian disease called Miller syndrome, which causes physical malformations of the mouth, eyes, and ears, and affects fewer than one in a million people. And in 2010, I picked this because this is one of the earliest studies of this type, a group at University of Washington took four affected individuals from three different families with Miller syndrome, and they completely sequenced these four individuals. And purely by comparing them to publicly available databases of genomic variation and looking for variants shared across these families that no one else had, 
They were able to identify in a matter of months the causal gene, this gene DHODH, for um, Miller syndrome. And so this is the power of the genome in Mendelian disease. We now have all the space that we need to look in. We know all the genes. And thanks to work that's gone on since the Human Genome Project, we know a lot about common variation in human populations. Now, the picture for complex disease, as you might expect, is a little more complex than this. These are diseases that are caused by multiple different genes combined with environmental factors. And they're generally common in the population. It's estimated that about one third of all Americans live with some sort of chronic common illness. So an example of that is heart disease. This man is Jim Fix. Uh, for those of you who don't know Jim, he's widely credited with starting the exercise jogging phenomenon in America. He was a big uh, advocate of running for exercise and health. Jim died at the age of 52 of a heart attack while running. Many people believe that Jim would have died much younger if not for his exercise. His father died of a heart attack at a substantially earlier age. This man is Winston Churchill. He was a legendary glutton who ate too much, drank too much, and smoked too much. Winston lived to the age of 80 when he passed away from a stroke. And so one of the things we're all interested in when we think about genetics and medicine and common disease is what differentiates the Churchills of the world from the Jim Fixes, and what can we do medically to move people into that latter category I'm going to stick with this example of coronary artery disease. We've known for a long time that there are some rare variants of strong effect that impact your risk of coronary artery disease. And these come from family studies. These are essentially like Mendelian diseases that create this common disease. And all of these are related to your body's ability to remove LDL or bad cholesterol from your bloodstream. And a single one of these variants, if it runs in your family, can modify your risk by increasing it by more than threefold or reducing it by more than fivefold over the population average. But these are collectively very rare in the population. At the same time, we now know of over 60 loci that are weakly affected with risk of coronary artery disease that are common in the population. And most of these individually confer a less than 20% change in your risk for coronary artery disease. No one of these things would result in any actionable change in your medical treatment. But collectively, they explain a fairly large amount of our risk for this. Interestingly, about 20% of them are in this same genetic pathway that's involved in removing LDL cholesterol from your blood. About another 5 to 10% are involved in blood pressure regulation, another known risk factor for coronary artery disease. But about 50% of them are either not associated with a gene at all or are associated with a gene whose function in this process we don't understand. And so all of these are potential novel therapeutic targets for treating coronary artery disease in the population at large. And this is work from St. Catharison's group in Boston. If you take all of these variables that we know about and you just add them up and say, how does the sum of this information contribute to people's risk, you get this nice distribution that's fairly continuous in the population of risk based on all of these common variants of individual small effect. But if you go out to the tails of that distribution, you see that people who are at very low risk, according to this, and people who are at very high risk have significantly different ranges of risk for coronary artery disease. This is from a paper that was published about three years ago. Um, the most recent data I've seen from this group, which is as yet unpublished, so I don't have the figure, indicates that there's about a fourfold difference in risk for the people at the highest end of this multiple gene risk score. And that, that explains individually about as much risk as these severe familial forms, but it affects a much larger fraction of the population and would have a much larger impact on public health to know this about individuals. So to summarize this section of the talk, genomics has greatly enhanced our ability to identify genetic variation conferring risk to disease which can be extremely helpful in diagnosis, and it's helping to drive novel therapeutic development. 
However, in many cases, we still don't really have individual targeted therapies. The likelihood that your genome will directly lead to something specific for you is fairly low. But as we gather more genetic data from more people and correlate this with medical um, records, we're going to increase our power to be able to do this on an individualized basis, and that's where we eventually want to get to. So I'm now going to hand this over to Tanya Smith, who's the Associate Director of our Production Lab here at NYGC. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tanya Smith, and I'm the Associate Director of the Production Lab here at the New York Genome Center. So when I joined the New York Genome Center in 2012, and I showed up on the first day, this is basically what the laboratory looked like. Not very exciting. It's an empty room. Um, we had to hire technicians and we had to purchase equipment. And in the first six months, we only managed to process and sequence around 100 samples. Now, fast forward. This is an actual picture or photograph of the laboratory that we have today upstairs. Um, last year alone, we were able to sequence over 30,000 samples for a thousand different projects for collaborators all over the world. Now, to me, being part of that kind of growth is something that I'm really excited and proud of. The instruments that you see in this picture are next generation sequencing instruments, and they're called HiSeq X. They're some of the most powerful machines that we have today for whole genome sequencing. This is another picture of the laboratory upstairs, a different section. Uh, one of our scientists, her name is Jamie, is actually about to set up a sequencing run. Um, and the instruments that, are, that you see are called NovaSeqs. They're Illumina's latest uh, model of next generation sequencing equipment. They're even more powerful than the instruments that you saw in the previous picture, the HiSeq X. As Mike mentioned, next generation sequencing technology evolves very quickly. In the last couple of years, we've seen huge advancements advantages or advancements approximately every three years where the new sequencing models can do twice or even four times the amount of samples that the previous models are able to do. If we think back on the Human Genome Project and the technology that was used towards the end of the project called Sanger sequencing, and we think about the fact that the human genome has three billion base pairs, those are strings of A, C, Gs, and Ts, for Sanger sequencing you can only take about I don't know, a thousand base pairs or so at a time and sequence them. So it takes millions of runs to complete the entire genome. With the next generation sequencing technology we have today and a process that is called massive parallel sequencing, we can take the entire genome and cut it up into small fragments, about 300 or 400 bases long, and we can sequence them all at the same time in parallel. This allows us to finish the human genome in two days the cost of a human genome today is about $1,500, and it takes a single com technician to complete the word. With the instruments that we have here at the New York Genome Center today, we can process and sequence more than 50,000 whole genomes every year, or roughly 500 samples every two days. Many of you may have heard about companies such as 23andMe. I would like to point out that these companies don't actually use next generation sequencing technologies. Instead, they use genotyping arrays. If we compare the two technologies to one another, to reading a book, then whole genome sequencing is equivalent to reading the whole book from beginning to end. Versus genotyping only allows you to look at the index and then to find scattered sentences in the book. You're not able to read the entire book. Now, why does this matter? And more importantly, what are we doing with all of this fancy technology? Well, we're hoping to fight cancer and other diseases, and we're working to advance personalized medicine to improve patient care. While cancer is not something that is typically inherited or passed on from parents to children, the mutations that do cause cancer happen in the genome of specific cells. With next generation sequencing technology, we can figure out what those changes are and hopefully how to fix them. Let's look at some examples of studies involving cancer research that the New York Genome Center is involved in. Leukemia is a type of cancer that involves blood forming tissues, such as bone marrow. It's also the most common type of cancer in children. 
Um, every year, three and a half thousand children in the U.S. are diagnosed with this type of cancer, and the exact cause of leukemia is still unknown. In 20 to 40 percent of cases, the children will have relapses after the initial treatment um, helped and cured the cancer. What we've been able to do so far here at the New York Genome Center is to identify the genes that are, de that are um, part in the development of the cancer, as well as genes that are associated with relapses and regressions of the cancer. And there's still ongoing studies that focus on how we can use that information to improve treatment. Neuroblastoma is a very rare type of cancer. And the tumors typically start in adrenal glands and then spread to the rest of the body. It is the most common cancer that is diagnosed in children under a year old. In the US, about 700 children every year are diagnosed with this cancer. Um, it is not well understood yet how the cancer develops and what drives the cancer to spread. The, the insight that we've been able to gain so far is we've been able to find some of the genes that are involved in how the cancer develops and spreads, and we've been able to identify key genes to focus on for possible treatment options. Now, how do we do this? We can't do it alone. We collaborate with other researchers and foundations, and we rely on funding from grants, as well as generous donations from the public. The two studies I just described involving cancer are part of the Sohn Conference Foundation. The foundation aims to treat and cure pediatric cancer. The main focus of the study is to figure out why some of the tumors respond well to the treatment while, other do not, while others do not, and why some of the tumors relapse. The organizations on the slide that you see represent some of our founding members that are collaborating with us in this study. Now, as Peter pointed out, DNA is not the only molecule that's important in organisms, and there are other molecules we can study in order to investigate diseases. Let's look at a real-life example of where we did RNA sequencing to figure out what is the underlying cause of a cancer. Let's take the case of Alana Simons, a teenager that was plagued with severe stomach points all through growing up. At age 12, Alana was diagnosed with a rare form of liver cancer. The cancer is called fibrolamella hepatocellular carcinoma. Alana underwent surgery, and um, the doctors were able to remove the affected part of the liver with the tumor. Luckily, the tumor had not spread to any other parts of the body, and Alana actually um, recovered from the treatment. Alana's story, by the way, has been featured in very um, in lots of different newspaper articles, and some of you may have even read about it. In fact, the story got so much coverage that even the White House took an interest. Being the daughter of a scientist, Alana decided to become a scientist herself and to study the cancer. With the help of the Fibrolamella Foundation, she was able to recruit 15 other patients. The patients agreed to work with their doctors and send um, samples to the New York Genome Center. When we processed the samples here, we sequenced and analyzed the data, and we were able to find the exact same mutations in all 15 of these samples. These results are now being used to develop targeted treatments for fibrolamella cancer. Now, I would like to point out that this example is rare and that the genetic changes in a particular cancer are not usually this obvious or consistent from patient to patient. Cancer tends to be complex, and many genes affect how a cancer develops, starts, spreads, or even how we respond to treatment. The real power of next-generation sequencing lies in the fact that we can sequence thousands of samples and different patients quickly and affordably, and that we're able to share this data with other researchers to work together towards advancing clinical care, to make sure that more stories end on a happy note such as Alana's. Thank you, everyone. I, uh, I would like to introduce Neville Sanjana to the stage. Neville is a core member here, a core fac faculty member at the New York Genome Center, and Neville will tell us about CRISPR and how we can use CRISPR to investigate diseases such as cancer. Okay, thanks for sticking around through the last talk here. So, uh, as Tanya told you, I'm, I'm a faculty member here at the Genome Center and also at NYU in the Department of Biology. And so I, I think this has been a really nice kind of setting of the stage here with a lot of these talks have focused so far uh, 
um, on sequencing, the reading of DNA. And kind of to end things, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the flip side, which is a technology that's really not quite as mature as being able to read DNA. Um, but we're we're trying to uh, we and many other groups are trying to make um, writing as easy as reading. So, um, as pretty much everyone has said before me here, that this uh, three billion bases of DNA, these elements of DNA, A's, T's, C's, and G's, is a complicated place. You know, a book with three billion letters, uh, especially written in a language that you don't know that well, uh, is difficult to decipher. And so. The kinds of questions that drive um, folks working in my lab uh, and many other uh, biomedical labs are, you know, which of these three billion A's, T's, C's, and G's are responsible for some of the cancers that Tanya talked about, are responsible for severe neurodevelopmental disorders like these uh, Mendelian diseases that we just heard about. Um, these, these are the kind of questions that we want to answer. And one way to, to get at, this, at these answers is, of course, to be able to sequence the DNA in people that have the disease. Um, but uh, other ways is we might be able to take a, a normal genome and actually engineer it and see if the changes we make have something to do with, with, with the, the disease phenotype in cells or in whole organisms. And just to drive this home, I think kind of the, the analogy that you know, my background uh, before coming in, into biology really was more of an engineer as a computer scientist. And if you think about it from kind of a computer science perspective, we have so many really quite sophisticated tools for manipulating information online um, that enable us to very precisely program um, or to find something, to write a document, uh, cut, copy, and paste in Microsoft Word is something probably everybody in this room has been able to do. Uh, has done, but in DNA, it really, those kinds of basic operations have been um, inaccessible. And so um, our group and, and a few other groups have really been involved in, um, in, a, in a technology that uh, has come along in the last few years, which is a way to manipulate, to get to that side of writing DNA or editing uh, genes or genomes. And this tool is, is that, that um, one of the tools that we use quite often is called CRISPR. And the easiest way to think of CRISPR really is like a pair of scissors, a pair of scissors that we can target to specific locations in those three billion A's, T's, C's, and G's. And um, it's, uh, the impact of this technology is really, it's kind of hard to even overstate what the impact has been on biomedical science. It has spread like wildfire um, through, through uh, biology and, and medicine. And this is kind of uh, encapsulated here with um, this cover of Science Magazine that called it the 2015 Breakthrough of the Year. And um, for those who are not familiar with, sci with uh, scientific journals, the kind of the more general the name is science, nature, that's how you know it's more important. So this is an important thing. Um, and you know, in a short talk, I really I'm not going to get to go into all the details, but I really like uh, this little quote that I read in the New Yorker to describe CRISPR. Another another sign that it's really jumped the shark. Um, from Hank Greeley at Stanford, he says the Model T wasn't the first car, but it changed the way we drive, work, and live. And kind of analogously, CRISPR has made a difficult process cheap and reliable. So it's not to say we weren't able to make edits to genomes. It was just a really hard procedure. And, and what this technology has done is really transform something that was very difficult into something that's much easier. So uh, to kind of get us into some specifics, I'm going to take an example from some of the work that we're doing in the lab right now to kind of get you aware of at least one, there are many, many applications of what can be done, not just in human health, but also in agriculture, um, in uh, infectious disease, malaria, many, many things. But I'm going to just focus on one example that's going to have to do um, with, with cancer work in my lab. And so um, because I'm going to get tired of just showing you A's, T's, C's, and G's, let's kind of, um, uh, instead of looking at that, let's think of the genome as a book written in English. And imagine that each gene in that book is actually a word. So that just makes it easier for us to, to talk about this. So here I've lifted, this is not an original composition here, but this is the first sentence or part of the first sentence, because it's a really long sentence, um, from On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And so uh, this first part, part of the uh, first sentence is, when on board the HMS Beagle, I was struck with certain facts in the distribution. And what these 
If you imagine each word in the sentence as a different gene in the genome, what these targeted precise scissors let us do is zero in on a certain word and without disrupting the other words around it, be able to snip that word and take it out. So now we have a genome that's just missing this, this one word. This is one kind of operation that was very difficult for us to do even just five years ago. Um, and that's become significantly easier in recent years. And so uh, some of the tools that we've been involved in developing is to take advantage of the easy programmability. Again, getting back to that idea of making it as easy as programming a computer. And instead of taking out one word at a time, what if we could go through the human genome, which has 20,000 genes, and systematically take out each one of those genes one at a time and just see what is the effect of say, deleting a particular gene on, a, on the chance that you get a disease or how tall you are, something like that, different traits. And um, what, from the, what I'm going to show you in the next few slides is we want to cast this large space of genetic hypotheses and then let something that's relevant about the disease, some disease-relevant phenotype, like uh, with cancer, it might be uncontrolled growth, be able to narrow down this large hypothesis space and zero in really on just whatever is the relevant genetic hypotheses, what are the genetic drivers of a particular disease. And so that's what we did. Instead of making one of these CRISPR scissors that can attack one gene, we actually made a whole library of these CRISPR scissors now a couple years ago that can knock out basically every gene in the human genome. And so this is kind of a schematized way to, to show this with um, microscopy of, of the different genes in the genome. But what what kind of question? I, I said that we can cast this wide space of genetic hypotheses and then use a kind of screening approach to figure out which hypothesis is relevant to the disease. What, let's, let's make this a little more concrete. So to give you one example, which is one of the very first examples we threw this tool at, is um, metastatic uh, melanoma. And so you can see uh, this is data from Levi Garraway's lab. You can see this, this patient comes into the clinic. This is um, stage four melanoma. You can see many lesions all over uh, the torso. And uh, in melanoma, so you got to take a little crash course in melanoma genetics. So in melanoma, um, there are many different genes that are involved um, in, in, in melanoma, which is skin cancer. And that's because it's caused by environmental, um, uh, it's caused by UV radiation. So it's a very mutagenic cancer. Um, but the most common driver is a mutation in a gene called BRAF. And about 70% of melanomas have BRAF mutations. So um, very intelligently, folks uh, in drug discovery said, well, if most melanomas are driven by BRAF mutations, let's develop a drug that can treat, that can specifically target this mutant BRAF gene. And in 2011, the FDA approved vemurafenib, a drug mentioned up there, that specifically kills cells that have the mutant BRAF. And that's important because all the other cells in your body express the normal form of BRAF. So it's important that it's, this is a targeted so-called next generation chemotherapy. And about a billion dollars was spent to develop this drug. It took about 10 years. Um, and a lot of hope was put on this drug. And unfortunately, like many um, targeted therapies in, in cancer, um, initially you can see that the patient is treated with this drug. You have this nice uh, remission. But after extended treatment of this drug, and this is just a couple weeks further treatment, you can see the cancer comes back. And at this point, uh, this melanoma is now resistant to Vemuraf. And Vemurafenib has no effect on slowing the tumor's growth. And so the question that we wanted to ask with this um, genetic hypothesis generator, with this uh, CRISPR library is what are all mutations that might drive resistance to vemurafenib? What's going on in this step? Can we figure out what genes are important? And so what we did is we took uh, human BRAF mutant skin cancer cells and we knocked out every single gene in the genome, not all in the same cell, but in different cells. And we looked, we put on vemurafenib and we said, what, what things survive? after we put on this, this drug, what particular genes, when you have a mutation in them, might enable survival in, in, in vemurafenib? And what, um, when there's no mutation, um, basically uh, the, the cells are wiped out. And that's actually what you're seeing right here. So vemurafenib, after two weeks of treatment, ignore most of this figure, after two weeks of treatment, most of the cells are, are going down uh, here. You can see this downward thing, but there's a couple that are enriched. What are the genes that are enriched? That was our question. 
And so um, I'm showing you some raw data here. This maybe is getting too much in the weeds. But what I want to show you is these are four different CRISPRs. And we can talk in a little more detail about what this actually means. But four completely different pairs of scissors that all target the same gene, this gene called NF2, which is a, a well-known tumor suppressor. And um, what we found is if you're missing this gene, this drug is not going to work for you. And um, we did this for every gene in the genome, and we were able to see a certain select group of genes uh, that when you're missing these genes, your cancer will become resistant to vemurafenib. And a few of these had actually been documented before. So we had kind of rediscovered every known vemurafenib resistance mutation, plus a bunch of new ones. Um, and what's really um, remarkable about this is that when you do some sequencing, so we've been talking about writing DNA this whole time. When you do some DNA reading in patients who've been treated with, um, with uh, vemurafenib and you sequence their tumors before vemurafenib treatment or after, some of the same genes that we discovered in this genome-wide CRISPR screen, um, you're able to see mutations only after vemurafenib treatment. So what this suggests is this tool, which does not cost, uh, you know, a uh, billion dollars and take 10 years to develop can help you preclinically already start to predict what kinds of mutations might crop up in people that are resistant to the drug so that clinic clinicians can start thinking in advance, how do I combine this chemotherapy with some other, re some other kind of treatment so that um, uh, maybe patients uh, will respond better to it? And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're now trying to think about combining vemurafenib with other things in uh, the signaling pathway that vemurafenib works in or with things like immunotherapies that harness the immune system, a completely different way of treating cancer. So that's one small story about how gene editing, how writing DNA is actually helping us um, uh, in cancer biology. Um, and with that, I just thank some of the people who are in my lab now, some of the people who I did that work I showed you uh, just a second ago. So I think we can take some questions from the audience. If you have questions, please raise your hand. People bring you a mic. And I'd like to ask that people can keep your questions brief. We hear a lot about the hazards of disclosure of genetic information, but um, this one's actually started with Michael. Um, it, when you provide people uh, more precise risks for their complex diseases, it seems to me that that would actually enhance uh, uh, modification of lifestyle. Has anybody directly tested that hypothesis? There has been a little work in that area, and I'm not familiar enough with it to cite it. But I think, you know, the question is really a matter of what's the magnitude of information we can provide. For a lot of things, for the majority of people, we're going to tell you that you have a very small baseline change in risk, and the activity that we're going to suggest is the same sort of thing that your doctor would tell you in absence of any genetic information. I think in some of the cases, like the cardiac disease example that I showed, some of these people are carrying a completely hidden, very large risk for cardiac disease where you might put those people on a treatment that you would normally only give to somebody who had already had a cardiac event, and now you might decide that it would be worth it to do that earlier, or that you would screen someone more regularly with a more intensive um, cardiac exam that you wouldn't normally do on a person who didn't have a family history of heart disease risk. So I think that's, that's the area where we're going to see the biggest uh, improvement of that as we start understanding the role of common variation in these common diseases. Um, so if you, uh, sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so if you look ahead, um, costs in, for sequencing is coming down, more and more data is collected, start leveraging machine learning models, get more insight. Uh, what do you guys see in 10 years' time? Is everyone editing their genome to go away from disease uh, uh, and, and, you know, maybe even beyond that, you know, not just for disease sake, but for other uh, evolutionary purposes? <laughs> Do you want to take this one or you want me to start? I think 10 years from now, you should start. I, I, so I think 10 years from now, I think we're going to see that it's probably much more common for people to get their genome sequenced. I think there's a question... We're still at a point now where the technology is getting enough better, enough faster, that 
I would not say that everyone should have their genome sequenced now necessarily. If you don't have a need for that genetic information and you wait five years, you'll get a better and cheaper genome than you would today. Um, I haven't sequenced my genome yet for that reason, not because I don't think it would be useful, but I just think it would get better. Um, whether we're actually going to be actively doing genome editing on real people in 10 years, I think is a, that's a trickier question. I think it'll start with very rare diseases where we know there's a single cause for it. But I think there are, there's enough, there are enough cases that we know about where a gene that we know is involved in one thing is involved in something else. And the effects are not always in the same direction. So the idea that we're going to go in and fix everything that we've found that provides a risk to people, that may actually do damage to things in ways that we can't understand right now. And I think that we do have to be quite cautious about how we go in doing that for common disease. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think we had another question over here on this side. Hi. Um I'm really excited by this site seek thing, and I was wondering if you might be willing to uh, describe the range of applications maybe for what you're seeing coming out of it. So at the moment, we're mostly using it in just a descriptive sense. We're really just trying to essentially atlas cells in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And really, uh, what I haven't really demonstrated here, what I showed was just saying, you know, we can categorize cells based on the RNA and then look at the protein they express. And we can do that in both directions. But where we're really seeing enhanced power is by looking at cells by those two modalities together. So that's one thing, just on, on uh, characterizing cell types in regular you know, healthy people, but also in different disease states. What we're also doing is uh, uh, collaborating with Neville's lab to look at doing genome editing and using a single cell readout of that. So really looking to see what is what is happening to the single cells at a very fine, very fine level of resolution, phenotypic resolution, uh, while we perturb different genes. So that's a couple of different pathways we're going. We're also trying to measure more things than just RNA and protein at the same time. Um, so we're, we're, we're collaborating widely with a lot of different people who work on a lot of different topics. So I don't necessarily want to predict where it's going to go, but uh, I think it's a very useful tool and, and, and applied to a bunch of different contexts. We, I think we'll find a lot of interesting things. Hey, uh, it's not as general. Uh, I was wondering if any of you could speak uh, specifically about the balance in deciding between, say, a genome sequence and an exome sequence. Like, obviously, the more data, the better. Uh, but, you know, there is almost like a magnitude of difference. So the balance between do I get a lot of information for a few people or do I get 10 times the number of uh, patients and get their exomes? Like, is there a point of diminishing returns in pushing for genome sequencing? Anybody? You guys want me to take this one? Are you? Well, I can start and you can take over. Okay. So exome sequencing will only look about 3% of the, the human genome, really only at the parts that, that code for the proteins. So if there's anything that you're interested in that's outside of those regions, you won't be able to see it when you do exome sequencing. So when you're looking at complex diseases, it's really helpful to get the picture of the whole genome. But as you mentioned, it's a lot more um, expensive, and it doesn't allow us to look at it as in as much depth as we could look if, in uh, exomes if we just do targeted exome sequencing. So I, I think, you know, I will say that this is actually a widely debated topic in the scientific field right now in terms of do you do more people, do you go more in depth on individuals? I think when you look at this right now, the cost differential between an exome and a genome is somewhere between three times and five times. And so as the cost of the raw sequencing goes down and the pieces around that are not going to get as much cheaper, things like sample collection and data analysis, um, I think the, the genome cost is going to come closer to the exome cost and we're going to come into a world eventually where I think we're going to transition out of the exome. And so I tend to think of doing the whole genome as a more forward-looking approach to this. These are going to be data that are going to be useful to us for a long time in terms of scientific research, whereas we're already starting to see projects that have been done as exomes 
and now because there are no more samples to do we're going back and doing them as genomes to try to to squeeze more data out of that um, but it's also true that right now if you have the samples to look at for a scientific study that we are better at understanding what's going on in the exome and that it would it would be more powerful for that study to do exomes than to do genomes all right we have time maybe for one more question here and then we'll go to the uh, the reception it's been said that the human genome is not done, that, that there are still large areas of, of repetitive sequence. Do, do you think that those are going to be important for personalized medicine? Um, and is it going to require a different um, methodology like long read sequencing, or, or are there some bioinformatic um, opportunities where we could do it with short read sequencing? That's a good question. Um, so, it, it is true. So we, we do say that the genome was finished in 2003, but we've actually revised that reference many times since then and are still in the process of doing it. And there are still parts of the genome that are just not accessible to current technology. A large fractions of that are not doing anything important, but there are parts of it that definitely are. And we know that a lot of the duplicated regions and a lot of the regions that are variable between different people, I think this is something we've really learned that was not anticipated when the Genome Project was started, is that there are not just the kind of small changes that we talked about between people, but in fact whole genes that some people have and other people don't have. And we don't have a complete catalog of that, and I think they will be important. And it will require some different technologies, the long read technologies you referenced, but it's also going to be the case, I think, that once we've done a certain amount of discovery for those things, that a large number of them, once we know they're there, we'll be able to read them out with the technologies that we have today. And so it's not clear to me that we'll have to do long read sequencing for everyone in the future. But it's also a very open question now where the costs of that are going to go. I could easily see 10 years from now, it would be cheap enough to do that, that we would just do that for, for every genome that we do.